What is a Homo sapien? We are undoubtedly human. On the surface, we are resilient, diverse, social, hairless, bipedal apes. But when we look deeper, we find that we are so much more. We utilize tools to achieve incredible feats of engineering. We use our creativity and language to not only advance our technology, but to also express ourselves in abstract and meaningful ways. So, where did it all start? When did this long story of ours begin? How have these traits developed throughout our evolution? Sit back and relax as we learn about the first humans to walk this beautiful spinning rock. Enjoy. Trying to define a human can be difficult. Do you define it in a scientific sense? where genetic and physical characteristics differentiate humans from other great apes? Or do you define a human by our anthropocentric views, technological abilities and emotional intelligence? Lucky for you, in this video we will be looking at when both definitions of humans began. Our story begins 3.8 million years ago, in Eastern Africa, with Australopithecus Afrinensis. Although not a human, Australopithecus afrinensis possessed both human and other ape-like traits. Afrinensis possessed a trait that is a rare occurrence amongst mammals in the animal kingdom, the ability to walk on two legs. Physical features that go hand in hand with bipedalism are present in the spine, pelvis, legs and feet. These features include a broad pelvis and a femur that is angled inwards towards the knee so that the centre of gravity lies directly above the foot. Afrinensis's pelvis and feet bones show us that they are entirely capable of walking upright. Afrinensis could also make and use stone tools which is another rare trait in the animal kingdom. Although, as of yet, no stone tools have been directly linked to Afrinensis, animal bones have been found with evidence of stone tool cut marks engraved into the bones. These bones were found in an area called Akika, located in Ethiopia. The bones date to 3.4 million years old, and clearly indicate that members of Afrinensis species made the cut marks because they were the only hominin species in Africa at this time. So, if Afrinensis was able to walk on two legs and use tools, two traits used to categorize a human species, then why aren't they considered human? Afrinensis possessed lots of features that resemble early human species, but also other great ape species. A gap was often present between the canines and adjacent teeth. This ape-like feature occurred between the canines and incisors in the upper jaw, and between the canines and the premolars on the lower jaw. Their rib cage was cone-shaped, like other apes. Like we discussed earlier, some of their limbs displayed human-like features that indicate an ability to walk on two legs. Their pelvis was human-like, as it was short and wide, but it lacked the refinements that enable humans to walk with a striding gait. They also had some ape-like limbs, which indicated that they were arboreal creatures walking on two legs when they came down to the ground. Unlike most modern apes, Afrinensis did not have a deep groove lying behind its brow ridge and the spinal cord emerged from the central part of the skull base rather than from the back, giving them an upright posture. Perhaps the most defining feature for Australopithecus afrinensis was their brain. It was small, averaging approximately 430 cubic centimetres, which made up about 1.3% of their body weight. This is only slightly smaller than the controversial Homo naledi's brain, 
measuring between 465 and 560 cubic centimetres. Judging from fossilised skulls, Homo naledi's brain was organised differently to Afrinensis and was more characteristic of other Homo species. It was ultimately this, coupled with other human-like features such as bipedalism and crown formation, that classified Homo naledi in the Homo genus. Australopithecus afrinensis is a wonderful example of the gradual change to the Homo genus, starting with Homo habilis. Homo habilis first appears 2.3 million years ago in parts of sub-Saharan Africa and marks the beginning of the Homo genus. So what classifies habilis in the Homo genus? Bipedalism is shared by both Australopithecines and Homo, so the water can become a little murky when defining early Homo species. So much so, that some previously attributed habilis fossils are now actually classified under another human species, Homo rudolfensis. Many anthropologists have attempted to establish specific criteria to use when determining a classification of Homo. Paleoanthropologists Mary Leakey, Louis Leakey and John Napier were among the first to extensively study the fossils of Homo habilis. Based on their research on habilis, they proposed the following criteria for classifying Homo. A brain size over 600 cubic centimetres, a round, globular skull, tool use, smaller jaws and mandibles, human-like postcranial features and feet that are fully adapted for walking, unlike the previous arboreal australopithecines. With some exceptions, cranial capacity can serve as an indicator of where a hominin fossil might belong in our evolution. In human evolution, we can observe the increase of brain size, beginning with Homo habilis and progressing even quicker in Homo erectus. The increase of brain size over time correlates with an increase in behavioural, cognitive and cultural complexity. Cognitive developments correspond with our ability to construct and form ideas, including the ability to think in and communicate via symbolic and abstract language, such as that used in storytelling, ritual and even art. So it was features such as Habilis's brain size, rounder skull, smaller teeth, a more human-like foot, and hand bones that categorised them in the species Homo instead of Australopithecus. Not much is known about Homo habilis, but we do know they lived a hard life. Predation, like most animals in the wild, was a constant risk, and with the advancements in technology still yet to come, Homo habilis wasn't one of the top predators like the later human species were. A fossilised habilis foot, dubbed OH8, shows signs that this particular hominin fell victim to an attack. The attacker was probably Crocodilus anthropophagus, which is an extinct species of crocodile reaching 25 feet in length. The owner of OH35, which is a leg bone belonging to either Paranthropus boise or Homo habilis, shows signs of predation. This time by a leopard, who probably snuck up on the unsuspecting hominin before dragging it up into the trees. Without technology such as fire, Homo habilis was at an increased risk of attacks such as this, and would later become extinct for unknown reasons 1.5 million years ago. Maybe they were outcompeted by later human species that were both more technologically and physically like us. Although Homo habilis is scientifically considered a human, they lacked lots of cultural traits that is so prevalent in later Homo species. Truthfully, whether Homo habilis is truly a human is a matter of interpretation but what is clear is that they were a transitional species, 
slowly changing from the old Australopithecines into the new and improved Homo genus. I suppose my question to you is, would you consider Homo habilis a human? Lots of people define a true human by some of the traits we discussed earlier. We modern humans are defined by our languages, allowing us to share abstract thoughts, sense of community, facilitating the formation of strong emotional bonds, and our culture, allowing us to display our unique and beautiful human intelligence. These traits can be traced back to what some people think is the first hominin that deserves to be called human. Homo erectus. Homo erectus's brain was 50% larger than that of Homo habilis, and it experienced the biggest drop in tooth size in human evolution. This point suggests that Homo erectus cooked their food, and there is even some evidence that Homo erectus learned to control fire as early as 2 million years ago. Fire is arguably one of the most important tools in our development. Today, we use it to stay warm, cook our food, roast marshmallows, and create tools and harness metals. Fire changed our diets, developed our culture, advanced our technology, facilitated our migrations, and warded off predators. Fire became a vital tool in human evolution, Without it, we wouldn't be where we are today, and we owe it all to Homo erectus. Fire also would have encouraged early erectus to socialise more often. Fire creates an area for all the group to sit around and encourages us to stay up later, strengthening relationships with those in the group. We may actually see evidence of this in erectus's facial morphology. A prominent brow ridge was present over the eye sockets. All archaic humans have a brow ridge, but Homo erectus had the biggest brow ridge out of all humans. Researchers have recently speculated that the brow ridge may have had a role in social signalling between archaic human individuals, enhancing friendly or aggressive facial expressions. They could have been a mark of dominance in earlier forms, but changed to convey a wide range of emotions. Patterns of social behaviour that distinguish modern humans from other living primates likely played significant roles in our evolution. However, it is exceedingly difficult to understand the social behaviours of our ancestors directly from fossil evidence. But a site in Kenya that is home to 97 erectus footprints gives us an idea of their social life. The footprints were made 1.5 million years ago and were likely left by a group of at least 20 individuals. One of these trackways, based on the size of the footprints, may have been an entirely male group, which could indicate they were some specialised task group, such as a hunting or foraging party, or maybe a border patrol. If correct, this would also indicate sexual diversion of labour, which distinguishes human societies from those of other great apes, and social mammalian carnivores. In modern hunter-gatherer societies who target large prey, typically male parties are dispatched to bring down these high-risk animals, and, due to the low success rate, female parties focus on more predictable foods. As well as sexual diversion of labour, Homo erectus may have had another familiar social feature, monogamy. Because Homo erectus males and females are thought to have been about the same size compared to other great apes, it is generally hypothesised that they lived in a monogamous society, as reduced sexual dimorphism in primates is typically correlated with this mating system. If erectus were living in complex groups like this evidence suggests, then perhaps they could have also had language. According to research, the genes SRGAP2C and SRGAP2D played a major role in the increase of size of the human brain. The SRGAP2 genes 
were significant milestones for the development of cognitive abilities and, presumably, for language, both appearing in Homo erectus by 900,000 years ago. The early signs of language likely started millions of years ago in the Australopithecines. Australopithecines were probably already able to use non-symbolic but referential vocalisations to display basic emotions and perceptions. This is highlighted by the use of older one tools. By the time Homo erectus evolved, the increase of brain size and cognition likely further developed this language. The invention of early linguistic code for words and phrasal structures might have happened during the Homo erectus reign as the proposal for a sudden mutation that gave rise to language in the past 300,000 years seems unlikely. Rather, it was a gradual change over millions of years. Just like our technological and physical traits, language likely evolved over the span of millions of years, gradually building up to where it is today. This use of very early language might have helped them create some of their technological advancements. By at least 1.8 million years ago, Homo erectus created the most long-lasting technology in our entire history, Oshillian tools. The Oshillian industry was made up of multi-purpose tools used in a variety of tasks. Studies of surface wear patterns reveal the uses of the hand axe included the butchering and skinning of game, digging in soil, and cutting wood or other plant materials. The Oshillian tools are more complex than the older one tools in that the core was prepared before flaking took place and tools were produced that had bifacial cutting edges. Bifacial tools are flaked on both sides so that they are sharper than old one tools. The ability to take a rock and envision that if you follow this process of carefully napping and chipping away flakes, it will make it into a point, is evidence that Homo erectus was capable of abstract and creative thinking. If Homo erectus was able to sharpen and change the shape of a rock, then surely they were able to do the same with wooden sticks, making them into spears. Sadly, there is no evidence of this, as wood is extremely rare in the archaeological record, as it decays very easily and rarely preserves. Even further evidence of abstract and creative thoughts come in the form of seashells with patterns carved into them. As you can see here, someone has clearly drawn a squiggly line on the shell, perhaps a doodle. We also know that Homo erectus dug up rock pigments, suggesting, in my opinion, that they may have used it to draw on themselves, or even perhaps rocks and walls. This is of course entirely speculation, as we don't have enough evidence to confirm this, but who knows what has been lost to the environment and what has failed to preserve. Regardless of if they did or didn't use pigments to create art, Erecta still shares lots of cultural and behavioural traits with us, even if they are the early, more primitive versions. They are undoubtedly human. <laughs>